Hi, everyone. This is Kim Alia, and welcome to part one in a three-part series on the Vitolkis Compass software. Uh, during this session, we're going to, first of all, start on uh, focusing on a little bit of a discussion and overview of George Vitolkis, his life and work. Uh, that'll probably take about 15 to 20 minutes. And then after we've done that, uh, by providing a context for his uh, work right now, we're going to go actually into the Vitolkis Compass software itself, and we're going to look at a few different cases. Uh, we'll analyze those cases. We'll look at how the program actually works, the advantages and benefits of using this particular piece of software. Uh, we'll compare that with what we call flat or numerical repertorization. And we'll look at the materia medica of the remedies that have come up, talk a little bit about the analysis of the cases, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, once we've gone through those cases, I will uh, be welcoming, welcoming on uh, one of the people working with the Vitolkis Compass people. Uh, who will be available for uh, a period of questions and answers. So let's go ahead and get started. You're welcome again. Uh, let's start by, uh, first of all, introducing uh, George Vitolkis. Now, uh, George, for me, is a, a personal hero uh, and mentor in my own study and practice of homeopathy. I remember about 25, 26 years ago when I was first starting to study homeopathy, I was actually in Holland with my wife, and we were at a conference uh, being put on by Roger Morrison and Vasilis Gegas. And after the conference, my wife and I uh, ended up going out to dinner with Roger Morrison and his lovely wife, Nancy Herrick. And I remember, I was still very new to homeopathy, I remember sitting across the, the table at a very lovely Indian restaurant in Amsterdam, and I uh, turned to Roger, and I didn't know much about homeopathy at this point, and I said, uh, Roger, uh, what do you think of George Vitolkis? And Roger is really not a person who I would uh, describe as being full of superlatives, but he looked at me, he paused for a moment, he looked at me and he said, if Hahnemann were alive today, he would be in total awe of George Vitolkis. And at the time, I didn't really understand the power of that statement because I didn't really know who Hahnemann was, but now knowing who Hahnemann is, that's a very powerful statement because Hahnemann, aside from being the founder of homeopathy, was in his own right of an incredible practitioner. I mean, he achieved tremendous success. People came from all over Europe to see this great practitioner of this new art of, of healing therapeutics. And so for, for, for Roger Morrison to say that, that Hahnemann would be in total awe of George Vitolkis really uh, blows my mind to this day. And I have to say that the more that I've learned about George's work, studied his Materia Medica, uh, looked at his contributions, I have to say that uh, there's quite a bit of truth in that particular statement. I don't know if Hahnemann would be in total awe, but certainly this is one of the great uh, practitioners uh, that we've had in the history of homeopathy. And an individual who's probably solely responsible uh, for the resurgence of homeopathy in the 20th century. So where did it all begin? Well, George Vitolkos was born in Athens, Greece in 1932. And uh, at a certain point um, it, through his travels, uh, he moved to South Africa. And this is where he first started studying homeopathy. And the way that this actually came about was that he was in a, uh, in a car accident. And uh, he had a friend there, Alain Naudet. Uh, Alain Naudet, uh, is one of the translators of the sixth edition of the Organon. There's, the, there's a number of different translations of the Organon, um, including the, um, the Stephen Decker translation, which is um, uh, a recent translation. But there's also this uh, translation done by Kutli Nade. And Nade was a friend of George Vitolkis's, and uh, it so happened that George Vitolkis got into a car accident. And he was a civil engineer at the time uh, in, in South Africa. And he remembered that he had been uh, at Naudet's home and he had seen this little book uh, called Borky's Pocket Manual of Materia Medica. And he asked Naudet about this book and where he could get a copy. And Naudet said, well, if you go to Johannesburg, I can tell you there's a, there's a bookshop where you can acquire a copy. And so Vitolkis went there. He purchased a copy of Borky's Pocket Manual. And he literally, and this is an incredible story, began to read it from the beginning to the end. Now, 
very few people get involved in homeopathy in this way by reading such a dense book because, you know, the pocket manual has got over a thousand remedies in it. And he literally read it from beginning to end. And he was somehow, he had found his life's mission. And so he went back again to this bookstore and so, sought other books on homeopathy. The, uh, the owner of the store recommended a book on the 12 tissue remedies, but for some reason, George wasn't interested. Professor Vitolkas wasn't interested in that book, but instead he acquired Kent's lectures on homeopathic materia medica and the organon, and he began to delve deeply into the materia medica and philosophy and therapeutics of homeopathy. Uh, he then moved to India. And he went to many different places. He went to Calcutta and to Madras and to Bombay. And he went to all these various schools to further his understanding, his knowledge of homeopathy. But at this point, he had developed such a, a profound knowledge of homeopathy himself that when he went to these schools, most of the teachers would be asking Professor Vitolkas questions uh, because he seemed to know more than they did about the various remedies and aspects of homeopathic philosophy and practice. Um, finally, in 1966, he graduated from the Indian Institute of Homeopathy. After this, he returned to Greece and he began to practice and he began to teach some of the local Greek medical doctors at this time. Now, obviously, these are not some of the doctors. This is uh, um, Hippocrates and Aesculapius. Um, but he did begin to, to work with some of these lo local Greek medical doctors. And um, he was so knowledgeable and achieved such great success uh, working with homeopathy that people began to flock to him. People recognized that he had a unique knowledge of this medicine and a, a wonderful capacity for communicating the difficult complexities of homeopathic practice uh, to the beginning student even. Then in uh, this continued and he achieved such great therapeutic success not only amongst himself but amongst this group of doctors which was really evidence of his skill as a teacher that eventually in 1970 he formed the Athenian School of Homeopathy, of homeopathic medicine. And here you can see a photograph of uh, George uh, shortly after the establishment of the school with many of these various medical doctors who were uh, working side with Professor Vitolkas and achieving such wonderful results. Uh, then in 1994, uh, George Vitolkas opened the International Academy of Classical Homeopathy. And this is, a, this is a beautiful school. I've had the great opportunity to actually spend some time there. It's a beautiful location. And this is where people flock from all over the world to study with Professor Vertulkis personally.
So hopefully people had an opportunity to read through those slides. We will post these slides uh, with the actual recording of this presentation. So if you missed any of that, don't worry about it. If you do want more information about the International Academy of Classical Homeopathy, you can visit Professor Vitolkis's website at www.vitolkis.com. You can see that the International Academy um, the uh, program has actually been adopted by a number of other institutes, including the Moscow Medical Academy, the National Medical Academy of Postgraduate Education in Ukraine, and the Aegean University of Greece. Now, in 19, just to get a sense of uh, Professor Vatolkas as an individual and his incredible accomplishments, uh, let's go through a few different things. In 1980, Professor Vatolkas was invited by the World Health Organization to write the very first article on homeopathy for a book called Traditional Medicine, which is actually published by the World Health Organization. And this was uh, uh, the main article in a roundtable discussion for their scientific magazine called the World Health Forum Journal. From 1987 through 1991, uh, in cooperation with the, um, the Info Department, Infotel Department at the University of Namur in Belgium, uh, he worked with, uh, a, in the creation of a very highly sophisticated computer system called the VES or Vitolkas Expert System. And this was created uh, in conjunction with the Radar Computer Software Program. In 1996, uh, Professor Vitolkas was awarded the Alternative Nobel Prize for his work in the field of classical homeopathy. This is a, an award that's also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, and it's a prize that's uh, it's a very prestigious international award that's given to honor people who are working on a very uh, practical and uh, practical and exemplary solutions to urgent uh, challenges that are facing the world today. And so this is quite some an accomplishment for anybody within our community to uh, receive such an award. Then in 1996, Professor Vitolkos was invited by the European Parliament uh, to actually explain the position of homeopathy. And amazingly, after his presentation, the European Parliament decided to vote in favor of homeopathic medicine. In 1999, uh, Professor Vitolkos was requested by the Council of Europe to make a day-long presentation on homeopathic medicine, and this was part of their evaluation of, in general, of alternative therapeutic methods. Uh, this was done before the Social Health and Family Affairs Committee, and the text was actually published, uh, and it mentions his receipt of the Alternative Nobel Prize. Uh, and also talks about his categorization of various alternative uh, natural therapeutic methods. Uh, Professor Vitolkas has written a, a number of different books. Uh, these are available actually from the Whole Health Now website. Um, I think there's maybe about 15, 12, 15 in total, uh, including some p uh, books that are uh, of various conferences that he's offered throughout the years. Uh, these books have been translated in, in up to 23 different languages. Uh, some of the better known books include um, Homeopathy, Medicine of the New Man, which is a book written uh, for lay people and has been translated into over 20 uh, languages. Uh, the Science of Homeopathy, which is uh, one of the best introductions for people who are skeptical about homeopathy. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's written from a very scientific point of view, and this is one of the things uh, that I most embrace about uh, Professor Vitolkas's work in homeopathy is that he, he does see homeopathy as a scientific method um, as opposed to um, uh, something which is outside the bounds of science. And this is something I've always appreciated, that homeopathy really is, if you understand it, really, really is a scientific process. Uh, he's also published a book uh, in 1991 called A New Model for Health and Disease. This was published in German and English uh, in 1991. And it, it's uh, basically a critique of allopathic medicine. It also sets out a new paradigm uh, for, for a, a science of medicine in our times. Uh, Professor Vitolkas is presently, he's been working on this for a number of years now, he's pr presently working on a uh, homeopathic materia medica, which will be in 16 volumes. Uh, I believe we have right now up to 12 volumes in English, and I think it's 13 in German. Um, and somebody no less than Roger Morrison has written uh, that it is my prediction, or rather my conviction, that this materia medica will be the standard 
against which all other homeopathic texts will be measured for the next hundred years. And that's a very powerful statement, but I, I, I can say that that really resonates personally with my own practice. I actually don't know how I could practice as successfully as I do in homeopathy without the use of this particular materia medica. And you have to understand how these books were actually created. Professor Vitolkas has gone through all of the old literature, all of the old journals, and he's found cured cases of remedies. And he's found where certain cured uh, cases, where certain symptoms would repeat that would be cured in these various cases that would be associated with a particular remedy. And then he would take this information and he would correlate it with his own cases, either in his own practice or cases that he supervised at the Athenian School of Homeopathic Medicine over a period of 50 years. And from this, he would write uh, what is really a very accurate clinical materia medica. The thing about this materia medica is that it's not dry. It's not a list of symptoms, a laundry list of information, which you, you know, after about a couple of minutes, fall asleep reading. It's written in such a way that it brings the remedies to life and it introduces a dynamic element or component to these remedies. You feel like you're reading about a person. And there are other materia medicas written like this, but some of these other materia medicas don't, aren't based or founded upon this, the, the clinical confirmation of symptomology that this one is written on, that this one is actually taken from cure cases, both from the old literature, his own practice, and from the practices of the many doctors that he supervised over a period of 50 years. So for me personally, this is an invaluable resource and an incredible legacy that Professor Vitolkas leaves for all uh, future homeopaths. Professor Vitolkas is also an honorary uh, professor at the University of, the G of Aegean in Greece. He's an honorary professor at the Moscow Medical Academy um, in Russia. And in uh, the year 2000, Professor Vitolkas was honored with the gold medal of the Hungarian Republic. Uh, this was actually given to him by the president, Arpad Gantz, uh, for his work in homeopathic medicine. His name is mentioned in the uh, website Better World Heroes among about a thousand personalities whose work had influenced or helped humanity. In other words, he's among a thousand individuals who have really contributed and overall helped humanity improve their quality of life. The German website, uh, www.mlahanas.de9, uh, when evaluating um, 34 different Greek doctors and professors of medicine who have contributed to humanity, actually ranked Professor Vitolka second after Georges Papanakolaou, who was the actual discoverer of the PATH test. So he's in incredibly good company, uh, being ranked number two after the discoverer of the PATH test. A recent book, uh, which just came out in the last year, uh, is called The Levels of Health. And this is a book that really expands on the science of homeopathy. Uh, that was the, kind of the, this is a, a sister companion. And this elaborates these 12 levels of health that a patient can belong to. And this is a, a very useful model for helping uh, us practice in a number of different ways. Here you can see the 12 different levels uh, divided into four different groups. The, the highest levels, levels uh, group A, levels 1, 2, and 3, would correspond to the highest level of health, um, highest, best genetic predisposition, best functioning immune system, and then as you move down, uh, the immune function and the genetic predisposition would deteriorate towards the lowest level of health. Those in the group A would have the highest life expectancy, uh, 90 years or even more. And then again, as you go, you go down, uh, the, because of the, 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 the poor quality of constitution, genetic predisposition, and immune function, the life expectancy would also correspondingly go down as well. And you can see that he's even attributed uh, in this particular model certain infectious diseases to which certain levels could be uh, susceptible to. So if you're in levels 1 to 3, you might be susceptible to things like staphylococcal or streptococcal infections, whereas if you're in level 4 to 6, you might be susceptible to things like uh, the proteus bacteria or, or gram-negative bacteria, things like that. Again, this is very useful in terms of uh, 
prognostic and diagnosis. Uh, when we go to the lower levels, like level seven to nine, you can see a, a severely com compromised immune system, um, uh, people getting serious infections, which can kill them very easily, and then even uh, more regressed is levels 10 through 12, uh, where we see people um, being very susceptible to all kinds of very serious types of infections. Uh, in this model, you can even use the various groups or levels of health to help determine which, pozole, which potency and dose uh, you might use for any particular individual. So uh, if somebody is in a very healthy group A, levels 1 to 3 uh, stage, uh, then they might be able to uh, handle a very high potency, even up to a CM, whereas if they're the lower group levels, uh, then that might not be the case. Um, now, this is a very quick overview. If you really want to understand this particular model, it, the best thing is to actually uh, purchase the Levels of Health book and read through it, and then you'll have a, a fuller understanding of how this model works and how it can be useful in your own practice of homeopathy. Um, in the book, he discusses in, in quite a bit of detail all the different possible reactions uh, that the organism's defense mechanism can have under various types of homeopathic treatment and the meaning of those various types of reactions. So he'll elaborate, you know, various parameters that de define the level of health and uh, what might happen with the same remedy and the same potency depending on your level of health. In other words, in, in one person uh, who's in level, uh, let's say, three, uh, who gets the right remedy, uh, that re their reaction might be different than somebody who's in level seven's reaction to the same remedy, who, which is also uh, correctly indicated. So again, I, I can't go through the whole model and approach, but if you, if you acquire this book and you read through it, I think it's a very interesting model and something that well, I believe will be quite useful and fruitful for the future. Now, uh, many people are probably saying, well, you know, I, I can't fly all the way over to Alana, so as beautiful as that seems and as lovely as that Greek music sounded, I, there's just no way I can make it over there. I've got a you know, busy practice or family life or, you know, any of a number of other reasons that it's not possible. It is actually possible, though, to uh, study directly with Professor Vitolkis. Uh, uh, in 2010, the International Academy of Classical Homeopathy launched their e-learning program, uh, and this is an, an academic online program which is based on the uh, highest educational standards. Um, if you want more information about that, you can visit our website at www.wholehealthnow.com forward slash courses forward slash vitolkas.html. So again, these slides will be posted if you don't get any of this information down, uh, but it is possible to, to study with Professor Vitolkas online uh, with using video cases, with analysis, uh, with lots of discussion uh, and mentorship. Now, most recently, Professor Vitolkas has been involved in a, a very exciting project uh, working with a computer software to develop what is called the Vitolkas Compass software. And uh, this is a software that was conceived from the ground up, which real emphasis is to provide uh, increased accuracy. Um, uh, based on thousands of real-world cure cases and to really help the practitioner to achieve a greater level of success in practice. And this is, you know, obviously the key. We all want to achieve a greater level of success. When we look at the history of homeopathy, we see that many practitioners had an incredible level of success. When we look at somebody, for example, like Adolf Lippe, who had a very busy practice in the Philadelphia area, he practiced for over 50 years. And in that 50 years of busy practice, he never lost one cholera, typhoid, or malaria patient. How did he do it? Constantine Herring treated hundreds of cases of pneumonia and never lost a patient. And you have to understand, this is during a period of time when the mortality rate of these diseases was extremely high. The mortality rate of, of cholera was anywhere up to 40 or 50 percent, or even sometimes higher. The, the, the uh, mortality rate from typhoid was very high. The mortality rate from even pneumonia might have been 30, 40, 50 percent. And yet these practitioners achieved 100 percent success in certain types of conditions. There's even a book called The Logic of Figures, written by the great American homeopathic historian called Thomas Lindsley Bradford, where he documents the efficacy 
of homeopathic practice in the treatment of a number of conditions, especially focusing on epidemic diseases. And he demonstrates over and over and over again, whereas the allopathic and eclectic medical doctors had 40 and 50 and 60% mortality rates, the really good practitioners of that period would have mortality rates ranging anywhere between 2 to 4 to 5 to maybe six to eight percent, but significantly less. So this is key. How do we, again, practice in such a way that we can have that level of confidence to know that when a patient comes in, we are more than likely going to be able to help them with the remedy that's prescribed. One of the wonderful things about the Vitolkis Compass software is it's extremely easy to use. As a matter of fact, I just recently learned how to use it in the last month, and it literally took me, I would say, excuse me, took me, I would say, a matter of, um, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to go through the tutorials and learn the whole software. Uh, it's, it's very easy to download. Uh, it's web-based. You simply uh, go to the site, you log in, um, and then there's a little tutorial that you follow, three different little tutorials. You follow them, and you're up and running and uh, everything's right there, everything is saved, it's um, protected, so easy to use, uh, secure, and um, you can get working on it almost immediately. One of the nice features of this program, which I really like quite a bit, is what's called the differential analysis. There's two parts. There's the differential analysis and the differential analysis plus. And in one of the cases that I'll be going through, we'll actually look at this uh, differential analysis plus. And you'll see it's a very nice way to be able to differentiate uh, potential remedies that might be possibilities in any particular case. So I think a very lovely uh, feature that is uh, unique to this particular product. And the great thing is that this is available, this can be used on your Mac computer, on your Windows computer, uh, you know, it's available on Android, iPad, it's all mobile app uh, devices. So pretty much anything that you're using, uh, you can access this internet-based software and immediately begin to use this. You can be, you know, wherever you've got an internet connection, you will have access to this particular program. So the key, again, the emphasis here is really success rate. This is the, the key to this program. It's, uh, it's an expert system. It's based on the work of one of the great homeopaths of all time uh, using a very powerful system of uh, really understanding how these symptoms group together that go beyond what we refer to as numerical or flat repertorization. In The uh, Genius of Homeopathy, which is a book written by Stuart Close, Close wrote, thus every whole exists under the conditions of the combinations of its parts. The combination of its parts creates a dependence of the parts upon each other and upon the specific form of the whole, and the whole exists in reciprocal relations with other forms in the external world. Close goes on to write, the totality means the sum of the aggregate of the symptoms, not merely the numerical aggregate, the entire number of the symptoms as particulars or single symptoms, but their sum total, their organic whole as an individuality. The totality is more than the mere aggregate of its constituent symptoms. What Close is saying here, and this is so true, is that when we practice homeopathy, we're not simply matching symptoms to symptoms. Hahnemann always talks about a complex of symptoms in the organon. And even in Aphorism 7, he says the outer symptoms reflecting, and he uses that German word Wesen, the, the Wesen, the Gestalt, the that inner dynamic pattern, the outer symptoms reflecting that inner pattern. This is what we are matching. We're matching one state to another. And you can't just simply add up the symptoms and put them into some type of mechanical adding machine and expect it to tell you the correct remedy. If that was the case, then everybody could practice homeopathy. No, we need to be able to understand what is characteristic, what, what conflicts of symptoms are important, how to 
relate to this particular individual's uh, gender, their, their age, and many other factors. And this is what makes for an experienced and successful homeopathic practitioner. And this is what the expert systems are designed to do. They're designed to help you pull out those patterns and in the process to help you learn what really is how to really actually practice homeopathic medicine. Now, I have on the call with me uh, the former managing director and who, uh, now uh, a board member of the Togus Compass. You can see him there on the left-hand side, uh, Elisterios Kichatskis. Hopefully I pronounced his name correctly there. Um, the, the gentleman actually interestingly on the right-hand side is always also Elisterios, which has created uh, uh, endless confusion for me. But in any case, I'm finally figuring that all out. Uh, and uh, Elisterios, are, are you on? Would you like to say hello? Hello, I would like to thank everybody for attending this uh, seminar. Okay, and, good. Um, Go ahead. I'm here. Okay, fantastic. Uh, it's been really a pleasure for us. Yeah, it's 3 o'clock in the morning in Greece right now, so he's probably a little tired. But he was kind enough to be willing to join me for uh, this presentation so that when we have the question and answer period at the end, because he really knows the system and the program and really everything inside and out, he's available to be able to really uh, respond to people's queries at the very end. So thank you so much for being up in the middle of the night to uh, be with us today. So, uh, having said that, let's uh, let's go on now and look at a couple of cases. Uh, we'll look at them, we'll discuss them uh, quickly, and then we'll, we'll begin to use the Vitolka's compass to see how we can solve these particular cases. So, uh, all right, all right. So the first case, uh, I'll go ahead and read it, and I'm not going to ask for a lot of uh, audience participation at this point, uh, just because we don't have so much time. Um, so I'll just read through it. I'll kind of give you an, uh, an analysis and understanding of the situation, and then we'll go from there. So Jonathan was a very reserved 13-year-old boy who came to my office with the chief complaint of not being able to focus in school. And this was a particular concern to the parents, as he had been a very good student up until just a year previously. In the last year, he had become much more distracted and absorbed in himself. He would spend hours playing with Nintendo and other computer games and would not apply himself to his schoolwork. He was still very well behaved and when asked by the parents and teachers what the problem was, he would usually just answer with a shrug of his shoulders and then would go back to doing whatever he was currently occupied with. Watching him as he sat there on the chair, he seemed very reserved, almost timid. He sat almost completely motionless, except for a slight twitching of his fingers. And, I, and actually, twitching may not be the right word. It, was, it wasn't really so much a twitch. It's just kind of he was moving his fingers in a kind of a restless manner. So maybe twitching isn't the best term there. As I went through my normal questioning process, he would answer very politely, but I had the sense that I was not getting the whole story. Now, when I, I've taught this case many times. It's a case from a number of years ago in my own practice. And when I, when I teach it, I ask people, well, you know, what do you think is important here? And people say, well, you're a 13 year old boy, this is pretty normal. And playing Nintendo, that's pretty normal. And then there will always be somebody in the, in the audience who will say, well, you know, the fact that his fingers are, are moving like that, that's kind of interesting. And I say, yeah. And I ask, well, why is it so interesting? And there are various reasons given. And sometimes somebody will really spot the most important reason, which is that the rest of his body is motionless. You see, you can't understand the value of a symptom in a case by looking at that symptom independent of the other symptoms. It's only in the context of the whole case that we can really understand the value of any symptom. And I, I, this brings to mind actually a case of Professor Vitolkis' of, uh, of a man who uh, is very suicidal, uh, who has uh, a lot of guilt, anxiety of conscience, who um, is intolerant of contradiction, uh, has many of these orum-like symptoms. Uh, but the man has this one strange thing, which that is that he's cheerful after stool. And now this is a, never a question you would ask a patient, you know, are, are you happy after you have a stool? Okay, because that's, that's a ridiculous question. And for most people, you know, after they have a bowel movement, they feel pretty good. So it's, it's not something abnormal. But in the context of somebody who's suicidal, 
who after they have a bowel movement, their suicidal feelings and depression disappears, that symptom becomes very interesting. And that symptom then points to a different remedy other than Orem, which is the remedy Natrum Sulfuricum. So in this case, it's the same type of scenario where the, the interesting thing is that his whole body is motionless and the fingers are moving. And this is the unique expression of his life force, is this movement of his fingers. We can also say that there's a type of abstraction of mind, which is interesting. We don't know yet what the what the etiology is here, but we have uh, we're beginning to get a sense of what's going on. And it's also interesting that uh, he likes to play Nintendo. Now, normally, 13-year-old boys who like to play Nintendo, that's completely useless and meaningless information. But again, in the context of the fact that the way that his life force expresses its energy through the movements of his fingers, that becomes an interesting piece of information. Continuing, when I asked the parents if he had any other problems, the mother indicated that he had always been quite healthy and in the past had always been a perfect little boy. Now, when I hear that, perfect little children, there's certain remedies that come to mind uh, for me, the way that I've been trained. You know, uh, I always think of Natrum Muriaticum as those perfect little children that have to use whiteout in kindergarten. Uh, sometimes carcinosin children can be extremely well-behaved. Sometimes they're very rebellious, but depending on where they are in the stage of their pathology, they can also at times be extremely, extremely well-behaved. Uh, you also see this sometimes in Orem children who aspire towards, you know, perfection and being the top of the class. And in, in, in the context of that, they can be extremely, extremely uh, proper and well-behaved children. So, of course, my mind was thinking about uh, those types of remedies, even though we shouldn't be doing that. It's inevitable. My mind always does it. Continuing, I, I could see that the parents were overly concerned with their son's lack of attention and his decreased performance in school. On further questioning, it was discovered that he had one younger sister and they was being groomed for the family business. I could feel that there was a lot of pressure on the young man and actually at this point I realized that this was an unfair expectation, an unfair burden that was being placed on this young man to, to be told at such a young age and even before the age of 13 that he was going to assume the mantle of the family business and that he had to be perfect and aspire to such high grades and do so well in school because he was the, he was the man of the family and would be assuming that position for the family. Uh, and so, you know, of course, to me, this, I, I sense that this was not a healthy situation. Continuing, the only other thing I could find was that he tended to sleep very bundled up and would like to dress warmly in the winter. He would almost never sweat, even when it was very hot. And he didn't sweat because he was such a cold child. This is interesting because generally children tend to be warmer than adults, so that's interesting information. He could also get loose stools when he was anxious or apprehensive about something he had to do. And uh, he had a very strong uh, desire for sweets, fruit, milk, and a very, very strong aversion to fish. It was uh, very, very intense uh, where, you know, he couldn't look at it or smell it or if, if it was cooked around him, he would have to leave the room. It was a, a strong, visceral response to fish. So this is the case. There wasn't a lot there. Uh, it's a, there's a paucity of symptomology in this case. Uh, and I think if you, if you do a flat numerical repertorization, let me, let me show you one right now that I've done uh, in radar so you can kind of see this. So here is um, a flat repertorization of this case. And you can see that the rubrics I've selected here are uh, the abstraction of the mind, the re reserved behavior. Uh, I've taken uh, three different rubrics here and I've grouped them together, which is the extremities twitching of the fingers, the uh, extremities restlessness of the fingers, and the, uh, in the mind section, there's this wonderful section, mind gestures, where there's a lot of uh, wonderful gestures, great section in the repertory, mind gestures uh, playing with the fingers. And you can see that I've grouped those three rubrics together because they're really the same symptom. I also chose uh, aversion to fish. There is no aversion to shellfish in the repertory. Uh, desire for fruit. And then uh, a rubric that oftentimes I won't use because it's so large, and also it contains so many warm-blooded remedies uh, as well in it, but I put it in there anyway, which is uh, general heat, lack of vital heat. And you can see that when I, when I do that, when I put these rubrics in here, and I look at the repertorization, I come up with a, a, lo a lot of polycrests, phosphorus, natmure, 
pulsatilla, causticum, pusphoric acidum, sulfur, dulcamara, aconite, belladonna, aluminum. From my knowledge of Materia Medica, none of those really give me that gut-wrenching feeling like this is a good choice. I, I don't get a feeling from any of those remedies like, yeah, this is the one I want to give. So let's, uh, let's go to the Vitolka's expert system and let's put in uh, these same rubrics and uh, with the same, uh, the same um, intensities and see what we can come up with, okay? And again, this is to contrast what we call a numerical or flat repertorization uh, with what is called uh, an expert system. Okay, so I'm going to go over to it. And I haven't actually logged in here yet, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go to uh, thetolkis.com, okay? And so you can see exactly how we get in here. Here's the, the home page for the website. Uh, you can see all kinds of different information on here. Uh, once you've, you've, you've paid your subscription, you can click on Login over here. And I'm going to type in my username and my password. And I'll click on Sign In. Okay. All right. So here we are, and you can see immediately there's some, on the left-hand side, there's uh, personal messages, um, you know, there's a little learn how to use VC uh, tutorials, there's a user manual with videos. Um, so there's all kinds of resources available to you. Um, here's some interesting new news. And if I want to get right into it, I can go ahead uh, over here, and you can see there's a number of tabs here, my compass. Uh, my cases, there's a Materia Medica tab, a repertory tab. I'm going to click on my cases over here. And I'm going to go ahead over here on the right-hand side, you can see there's a little button here for new cases. So I'm going to go ahead now and click on new cases. And I'll go ahead and give this uh, case a title. So uh, let's say uh, Wounded Boy. Okay. And uh, main complaint is, let's say, abstraction of the mind. Okay. And uh, so he's a male, we we'll select male, and I let's see, he was born in 1984. And okay, we'll, we'll say the first visit is now, none of that matters, referred by, you can put that in there. Uh, and then you can go ahead here and click on the little button here that says create case. And there we go. Now we're in the, uh, the, the, the actual part of the program where we're going to actually start to type in our information. You can actually go over here and you can type in your case notes. There are actually even templates over here that you can use um, for all kinds of different uh, conditions and uh, stages of life, like arthritis, asthma, babies, children. These are very nice, actually, if you want a little bit of guidance in terms of the types of questions you might want to ask for any particular type of condition. Um, I can also, if I want, go over here and I can select all of the copy here. So if you've got your cases someplace else, let's say you've got them in a Word document or wherever PDF file, or you've saved them in, a, in another location wherever that you can copy them, I can copy these by typing uh, Control C or Command C if you're using a Mac, and then Control V, and then I've actually put my case right in here. Um, and then that way you can transfer all of your cases directly over into the Vitolkas Compass software. Once you've got your case typed in over here or you've pasted it in, you can go over here to the left-hand side and you'll see there's a button here that says New Consultation First Visit. So I'm going to go ahead now and click on New Consultation First Visit. And now I'm in a position to begin to add in symptoms. So you can see the little button here with a plus. I'm going to click on Add Symptoms. And now I've got my little repertory here. Now I can, I can search in a couple of different ways here. I can search through the structure of the repertory, where I you know, go mind, head, pain, periodical, and I go through the primary rubric through the sequencing of the subrubrics. I can search the actual structure, or I can simply do searches. Now, as, as I've been playing with the Vitolkas Compass, I find that it's actually quite easy to simply just type in uh, in this field here, whatever words I want, and search them in that way. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I find it's a, it's a very a quick and easy way to find the information. So I'm going to type in abstraction, okay, mind, and then I'll hit enter. And you can see uh, here is abstraction of mind. Uh, if you want to see the remedies, here you can see this is uh, another uh, 
other rubrics which are cross references or similar rubrics to this one. There's a little arrow here on the left which shows me the remedies in that particular rubric in case I'm interested in seeing them. I don't really care about that right now. Um, since this was a, an important symptom in the case, I, I think I'll go ahead and give it an intensity of two. So you can see here there's the number two. Now for those of you who are not familiar with intensities, uh, Vitolkis has uh, assigned three criteria for determining intensity. One is the strength of the symptom. Uh, two is the, um, uh, the, the frequency of the symptom. And three, how voluntarily the patient shares that information with you. So if you've got a patient who comes in, kicks down your door and says, my head is killing me all the time at the top of their lungs, you know, uh, then that would probably get a three or four intensity as opposed to somebody who said, well, you know, you asked them, do you ever get headaches? And they said, well, you know, back in 1964, I had a headache that lasted for two minutes. Well, that would probably get a zero intensity. Uh, I would, I would uh, basically say that this should be a two intensity, so I'll go ahead and give it a two. And when I do that, you can see now on the left-hand side uh, that this rubric has now been added to my uh, analysis, mind abstraction of mind with uh, intensity of two. The next symptom uh, was the fact that he was extremely reserved. That was quite prominent in the case. So I'll type in reserved, okay, and I'll hit enter. And you can see here we've got reserved, okay. Uh, and I'm going to give this a little bit stronger because it was really quite prominent in the case. Uh, so I'll go ahead and give that an intensity of three. Uh, and then we've got the, the movement of the fingers. So first one was twitching fingers, okay. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and give that uh, a three as well. That, that seems like a very important symptom to me, so twitching of the fingers. And then I'll do uh, restlessness fingers. Okay, and I'll, I have to give that the same thing of three as well because I'm going to end up combining those later on. West of the fingers, and then I'm going to uh, put in playing with the fingers, so playing fingers. Okay, you can see this is very easy. You just search for what you're looking for. There's mind gestures, playing with the fingers, and again, I'll give that an intensity of three. And then there was the uh, aversion to fish, okay, so uh, aversion fish, okay. And I'll hit enter, and that was fairly strong. Um, I'll give it a two. I think that's reasonable, a version to fish a two. There was the desire for fruit. And that wasn't quite as strong as the aversion to fish, so maybe I'll just give that an intensity of one. The, the fish was stronger than the fruit, although the fruit was reasonably strong, but I'll, I'll give that a one. And then the last symptom was the lack of vital heat. So I'll type in lack vital heat, okay, and enter. And then we've got uh, generalities, lack of vital heat. And I'll give that a two. It was pretty strong on the case. Even though this isn't such a great rubric, I'll go ahead and put it in there as well, okay? Uh, now, as I said earlier, I don't want to leave these three symptoms here on the left-hand side, the twitching of the fingers and the restlessness of the fingers and the, the playing of the fingers as separate rubrics because then I'm overemphasizing one symptom in the case. These are not three distinct symptoms. they are three expressions of the same symptom. So what I can do is I can go over here to where it says other options, and you can see that I can, um, I can sort by chapters and also by degrees. Um, I can turn symptoms on and off. And I can also merge symptoms. So I'm going to select merge symptoms. And I'm going to go ahead and check off uh, the twitching of the fingers, the restlessness of the fingers, and the playing of the fingers, these three, OK? Um, and then I'm going to go over here where it says merge selected, OK? And I'll click on them. And now you can see, just like I had in my radar program over here, if you don't remember, here it is. You can see I had those three A's over here because they were merged together. I got the same thing in the Vitolkis compass. The, these three are now grouped together, okay? And then once I've got that, I can go over here to where it says solve, okay? And I simply click on the solve button, and it loads my little analysis in there. And you can see that uh, two remedies come up very high. Actually, there's five remedies that are coming up high, natrium muriaticum, asarum europium, phosphorus thuya, and sulfur. Now what's interesting here is uh, that Asarum europium, if you look here, came up number two 
and you look at the numerical repertorization, you see that it didn't come up in the top 10 remedies. And yet in the Vitolkos expert system, it actually came up as the second remedy. And that's interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it didn't show up in the numerical repertorization so high, but it's also interesting is because natrium muriaticum and phosphorus and thuya and sulfur, these are polycrest remedies, remedies that are well-known, well-prescribed, well-represented in the repertory, and we expect them to see them come up very highly. A sarm europium, wild ginger, on the other hand, is a much less prescribed remedy, one that's not as well known, uh, one that is not nearly as well represented in the repertory, and yet this expert system is able to pull up this asarm europium and group it with these better well-known, better prescribed remedies. Now, we can also uh, look at other uh, groupings, just like the large or the small. If we, we didn't see anything within all the grouping that, that fit, our, fit the bill for the case, we could click on small and look at smaller remedies, or, or maybe just the large remedies, or again, uh, all the remedies. Uh, so we have that option as well. We could also um, click on the book over here and read about any of these remedies as well. So, for example, we could click on Nat Muir over here, and we could read uh, a little bit about Nat Muir. We could read what George Patolkas, his notes about natrium muriaticum are. We could read in Berkey or Kant or Allen. And this is where I like to integrate um, uh, something like the Vitolkos Compass with the uh, Radar Opus or Radar Program because the Radar uh, Program has a much larger library of materials. So I can use the advantage of the Vitolkos Compass's very excellent expert system which is going to suggest remedies uh, that go beyond a numerical repertorization and I can combine that with this massive library of materials including you know old journals and, and you know incredible resources. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, actually find out where a SARM shows up in the numerical repertorization. I'll type in ASAR, I'll hit enter, and here is a SARM, okay? And if I click here, here I can see uh, the keynotes. It's a, it's a well-known remedy for sensitivity to slight noise. Uh, Theridian and a SARM europium are two of the remedies which are most characterized, uh, characteristic of this particular symptom. Uh, but what I can also do here is I can search for this, okay, uh, in all of the references that are contained in the program. Okay, and uh, when I do that, I can go ahead and limit it. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and limit it to Vitolkus. And here is that wonderful book, Vitolkus' Materia Medica Viva. And if I scroll down here a little bit and I start to read, and here you can see the wonderful way in which this book is written, where it's almost, the, it's almost like the personality of the remedy is being described, as if it is, as Close said, uh, an, ide an individual, a personality. Uh, somebody you would actually meet in the street. And if we scroll down a little bit here, we can see that Vitolkus writes that the development of the Asarum picture in a child illustrates this theme. One sees a child who is quite serious. Remember, we, we, I wrote the perfect little boy, quite serious and mature for his age and who is shy at the same time. One who tends to avoid playing with other children his own age and prefers the company and conversation of adults the perfect little boy. Typically, the child's parents pressure him to work and to excel at his schoolwork, piano lessons, foreign languages, etc. And the child tries to meet their expectations. He studies and studies, pushing himself more and more until, as a consequence, he has a breakdown. His nervous system becomes tremendously overstimulated. His nerves on edge. He starts fidgeting, constantly wringing his fingers. And there you've got it. You've got this really lovely fit. It's, it's one of those cases where you get this gut-wrenching feeling like this is the remedy. This is the remedy that will help this case. And this is a, a case where I did prescribe a SARM europium in one dose. It's a number of years ago at a 200C potency with fabulous results. The, the child improved dramatically. Um, the movement, the gesturing of the fingers stopped. The, the child's reserved nature came out. Of course, the, the parents needed to change their behavior as well. They actually represented an obstacle to cure for the health of this child. But this remedy was a catalyst uh, to, as Hahnemann says in the ninth aphorism of, of the organon, allow this child to reach the, the lofty goal of human existence. 
So we can see the, the value of something like the Vitulcus compass in this case, uh, in that it was able to, and as it will in many cases, uh, really bring up the, uh, the correct remedy. All right, so I thought I would uh, just quickly, just for the fun of it, just show you a little bit about Asarm Eurokin. This is, as I mentioned earlier, is wild ginger. Okay, uh, and I will post this, these slides as well. This is, this is taken largely from uh, Materia Medica Viva, and these are some of the important themes or ideas uh, that you find in this remedy. Um, the tremendous sensitivity, not just to noise, but to touch, to sex. Everything is perceived in Asarm Eurokin as a type of pressure. Um, and uh, as, a, as a consequence of that, they can be very nervous, very excitable. They can have chemical sensitivities. Uh, they can withdraw, become very absorbed and reserved. Even they can feel fixed and stuck. And because there is so much pressure, uh, they can. This is a remedy, one of those remedies like cannabis indica and agaricus uh, and holonium. Um, that can actually have out-of-body experiences because there's so much pressure that they can't stay in their body any longer. Everything is perceived as such a violence against them that they actually have to leave their bodies. Um, Professor Vitolkis in his Materia Medica Viva says that there's two primary reasons uh, that somebody will go into an Asarm state. One is alcoholism, but this is a remedy that's actually been used to treat alcoholism and also mental overexertion, which is what we saw in uh, th this particular case. Uh, the, the patients tend to be very timid and nervous, but even though they're timid and nervous and very reserved, they exhibit a great deal of ambition. And so in this sense, it can be very similar to Nux Vomica, you know, with this uh, desire to achieve, this desire to, for ambition and this drive to, be, to excel in life. The, the, the pressure can be either self-imposed or imposed from outside of themselves by a friend or family member. One of the big characteristics of this remedy, as I mentioned earlier, is a very tremendous oversensitiveness of the nervous system, extreme hypersensitivity, and this especially focuses on the auditory nerve where they're extremely sensitive to the slightest noises. Um, the way, one of the ways you'll distinguish Asarm Europium from Theridion is that Asarm Europium uh, have the sensitivity of noise, it, the noise actually makes them feel like their, their mind is breaking apart, whereas Theridion will tend to more uh, experience noise as a painful sensation. So this is one of the ways, let's get rid of that screen there, that you'll distinguish those two. Um, it's described as uh, chills, internal irritability, and that the mind will actually disintegrate from the noise. And they're particularly sensitive to certain types of noises, like rattling noises, scratching, grating. Uh, in, the, in the proving, I think it said something like uh, scratching of linen. So you can imagine that, that even something as, as minor as the scratching of linen would cause uh, an excitation of their nervous system. Now, of course, in this particular case, we didn't see this. And probably one of the reasons is that the child had not yet developed in its pathology enough to exhibit this particular symptomology. So it's still earlier in the developmental stage of, of the remedy picture. Uh, this is one possibility at least. There, there could be others as well, um, but uh, that might be one possible reason that we don't see that symptom. And again, remember, you don't have to have every symptom to prescribe a particular remedy. Uh, these are oversensitive, overworked, overstimulated people. Eventually, because of this overworked, uh, intense pressure on themselves, either imposed, self-imposed or imposed outside of themselves, their mind shuts down, they feel that there's something wrong, and they feel that they're going to go crazy. Uh, they can even at this point become kind of hysterical. Uh, these are difficult cases of SARM cases because oftentimes, like natural muriaticum, which is a remedy which can oftentimes be confused with a SARM, there's an inability to express themselves. So these can be oftentimes difficult cases to uh, find the right remedy for in practice. A lot of chilliness in this remedy, and it's described as chills that run through the body, intense chills, thrills and chills, and oftentimes associated with scratching. And in this respect, it can be very similar to uh, what we see in the remedy Agaricus muscarius. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, initially you may not see the sensitivity to noise, but it may develop later on. And here you can see um, an extraction of all of the different rubrics where a SARM's sensitive, sensitivity to noise is seen. Uh, 
And as I mentioned earlier as well, uh, in the later stages at least, we can see oftentimes the patient reporting out-of-body experiences where they literally feel like they're floating out of bodies. If you, if you look at the proofings, it'll say things like limbs floating in the air, extremities floating in the air, things along those lines. And uh, this is one of the remedies that has the strongest aversion to sex of any remedy in the material medic, which is not surprising if you think about it, because again, they're, they're, everything is perceived as violence, as a form of pressure against them. And so they have an incredible, uh, intense sensitivity and aversion to sex. It's so strong, as a matter of fact, that they have a, aversion to sexual jokes. It's, as a matter of fact, it's the only remedy in the rubric um, aversion to sexual jokes. If they hear a sexual joke, they'll literally get up or, and leave the room. If, they, if it's a child and uh, the, the, the friends of the parents come in and kiss the child, the child will go and take a shower to be relieved of this uh, invasion on their space, uh, this pressure, this violence against their body. So even in children, we can see what we call a disgust for sex. And again, this is unusual and, uh, and something that characterizes a SARM europium. They don't want to be touched. Even casual touch uh, is something to which they are extremely sensitive and for which they have a strong aversion. And as I said earlier, a uh, very uh, difficult time expressing themselves. In this respect, it can be very similar to natural muriaticum. This is a remedy that can be confused with mercurius. Uh, in certain stages, mercurius can be very shut down, especially when, they, when they, they don't quite trust you in the intake process. They can appear very similar to a SARM where they're shut down, reserved, not communicative. It can be confused with theridian because of this tremendous sensitivity to noise. And of course, it can be confused with natural muriaticum, which is also an extremely reserved remedy, but for different reasons, not because of pressure, but because of some type of emotional injury a mortification, a, a death of a loved one, a, a separation from a, a family member. These types of things are the etiological factors which contribute to the natural muriaticum picture. And it can also be confused with nux vomica, the ambition, the chilliness, the desire to succeed. Of course, one very strong differentiating factor is that a SOM europium has a very strong aversion to sex, whereas nux vomica generally will have a very strong inclination towards uh, sexual activity. This is a remedy that really fits our times because it's the result of pressure, of a desire to achieve and succeed and be number one. And so you can imagine that this would not be an uncommon remedy in practice. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a remedy that is very sensitive to various chemicals and is one of the, uh, one of the, the common remedies for uh, chemical sensitivities. People who are panallergic, who are, when they walk into the room, are sensitive to just about anything that you can imagine. I've also included some uh, repertorizations which compare a SARM and mercury, a SARM and theridian, a SARM and nux vomica. And again, these will be posted up on our website so you can view these at a later time. Okay, so I hope that was helpful uh, for everybody. Let's move on to the uh, next case. Okay, so this is a, a male, 33 years old, and um, first consultation, uh, psoriasis universalis, which means it's all over his body, um, maybe except for some small parts in his armpits, started six years ago. Uh, he assumes that uh, before its manifestation, he felt sorry about his sister's divorce. Uh, he's sociable, generally cheerful. Uh, he's irritable, which is very strong, degree, uh, intensity of three. He tries to restrain himself, but feels like there's a boiling and in anger inside. Uh, the psoriasis tends to be worse in the spring and autumn, also worse from alcohol, pork very strongly, and dry nuts, but not quite as, um, not quite as much. He feels like vomiting if he smells vinegar, although he loves lemons, and he eats them like, like fruit, so it's extremely strong. He's not interested in sweets. He has an aversion to fat and slimy foods. Slimy foods are pretty strong, too. He likes soups. He uses uh, salt normally. Uh, he's better after bathing in the sea and also sunbathing. And he prefers warm weather, although he perspires a lot, and especially his feet with an offensive smell. He has thirst for large quantities. He can't cry in front of others. Uh, he cries alone and he feels better after crying. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of fears. He's offended easily. 
He's better when talking about his complaints and from consolation. Um, he had rheumatic uh, pains in the joints when he was 18, and he also had glandular tuberculosis when he was three, and he had keratitis of the left eye while he had the tuberculosis. Okay, so that's the case, and I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to copy this, okay, so we have this information. All right. I'll copy it, and I'll go back to my uh, Photolcus Compass program, and um, you can see I've got two tabs up here. I've got one for the Materia Medica over here, and I've got my Vitolkus program. So I'm going to click over here on the Vitolkus program. I'm going to go back to my cases, okay? And I'm going to select New Case again, all very easy. And I'll type in, um, I forgot what was it? New Case. 33 year old man, okay? And the main complaint is psoriasis. And the sex, let's see, is a male. And does it have his age here? I'm 33, so I don't know. We'll just uh, estimate here. Uh, the 1980, I believe. So 1980. 1980. And date of the first visit and referred by. And we'll go ahead and create the case, OK? All right, and then I could go ahead and uh, either type in my notes over here or I could paste it in, okay? And then I'm going to simply go ahead and do the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and repertorize this case and try to come up with the, uh, the best analysis and hopefully best remedy. So I'll click over here on the left-hand side for new consultation. I've got my new consultation. I'll go ahead and click on Add Symptoms. And I'm going to go ahead and do this fairly quickly. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and type in these. Uh, new symptoms. So just you can just watch me do this, so you can see how quickly uh, this program can work. So I'll type in um, eruptions, psoriasis. Okay, hit enter, and I can see down here. If I scroll down here, I got skin eruption psoriasis. That was a pretty strong thing. It was all over his body. We'll give that an intensity of three. Okay, uh, then we've got. Um, ailments, grief, okay, okay, and with some grief, that wasn't too strong, it was kind of a nebulous uh, expression by the patient, so let's just go ahead and give that a one, okay, um, if you remember he had irritability, okay, and uh, that was pretty strong, uh, it was three underlining, so we'll go ahead and give that a three, and then there was the um, Alcoholic drinks, which aggravated, so alcoholic drinks aggravate. Okay, oops, did I type that incorrectly? Alcoholic drinks. Oops, what am I doing? Oh, oh I'm sorry, I'm spelling that incorrectly. A L C O H O L I C drinks. There we go. Okay. Alcoholic drinks aggravates, and uh, I think that was uh, intensity of one. We'll give that a one. And then there was the pork aggravates. Okay. And the pork aggravates, that was a strong one, if you remember, so we'll give that a three. Uh, and then we've got um, exposure to sun ameliorates. Exposure sun ameal. Okay, and uh, we'll give that a one. And then um, vinegar aggravates. Now you'll notice I'm putting a lot of symptoms in here. That's one of the nice things about something like the Vitolcus uh, compass is that you can you can put in a lot of information. Um, you know, if you do this in a, a regular numerical repertorization, you're always going to uh, come up with you know sulfur as the first remedy, and then all the other polyquests following suit. Um, but when you use an expert system like this, um, you can, you know, it'll it'll pull out information in a different way. So lemon, uh, lemon, desire for lemons, right? Desire, right? And uh, that was a three. And then uh, profuse perspiration. Profuse perspiration. That was a two. 
Okay. And then uh, perspiration foot senses and oops, okay, foot perspiration senses. Okay, perspiration foot senses, and that was also a two. Okay, and then thirst for large quantities, thirst. Large quantities, and that was a one. And then slimy food aversion, slimy food aversion, and that was a two. And then desire soup. Now you see, the nice thing is I don't have to we worried about the order that I type in these words. I can type them in in any order that I want, and it's going to simply search for them. That's very nice. Uh, weeping, and even if I don't know the structure of the repertory, it's not a problem. Weeping, uh, tearful, uh, a meal, okay? So weeping, tearful mood, symptoms of meal, and uh, that was a one. And then offended easily, and that was a one as well. And then consolation ameliorates, and that was also a one. And bathing, C, meal, that was a one. And then um, skin, which is itching and burning. And uh, skin, itching, burning, that was a two. And then the um, history of tuberculosis. Okay. And uh, that was a one as well. Okay. Now you can see I was able to put in 18 rubrics you know, in about, what, five minutes? That's pretty fast. And you can see it was easy to find the information. Um, I've got it in there now. I've uh, applied my various intensities. If I wanted to group afterwards, I could do it. Um, once I've got that in there, I can go ahead and click on the Solve button over here. And you can see uh, a number of different remedies have come up. Now, I didn't quite type this in correctly. I was doing it a little bit fast. Um, if I had done it correctly, I would have had the, the two remedies that would have come up highest would have been uh, sepia and belladonna. But I must have done something incorrectly here. Three, one, three, one, three. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is that um, I could now um, say, okay, well, you know, I don't really see a remedy here that really I get this gut-wrenching feeling like this is the remedy. So what I could do... Um, is I could do something here called the Differential Analysis Plus, which is going to uh, suggest um, r other rubrics, other symptoms that might help me to differentiate the best choice. And this, to me, is a, just a fabulous feature. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Differential Plus here, Differential Analysis Plus. And the, differential, the difference in Differential Analysis and Differential Analysis Plus is that the Differential Analysis um, doesn't correspond necessarily to these symptoms or the, the gender of the patient or the age, but the differential analysis plus takes all those things into consideration and it suggests uh, various rubrics based on that. Um, okay, now unfortunately I did not do this correctly, so let me go back and see what I missed here. Okay, so skin eruptions three, one, irritability three, alcoholic drinks one, pork three. Uh, ah, I left out you know, uh, exposure to sun, vinegar aggravates, desire lemon three, profuse perspiration two, thirst for large quantities. Foot, foot offensive, two, 
search for large quantities. One version twenty two two. Um, desire for soup. Two. We be cheerful mood. One. Send it easily. One. Solution is one. Be see one. Okay. I'm not sure. I typed something incorrectly, so I missed a rubric or something. But in any case, this is a wonderful feature because now I can go through and I can go ahead and select. Okay, so for example, it turns out that this guy is also talking in his sleep, okay, and grinding his teeth. Uh, there they are. There's the symptoms I was looking for. Perfect. So grinding of the teeth, and that is that's a fairly strong on the case. So I'm going to add now, see I didn't know that before, but this was suggestions of symptoms that would help me to differentiate. So I'm going to go ahead and add the grinding of the teeth as an intensity of two. And he's talking to sleep and this is really a problem. He does it all the time. It's intense. It keeps his, uh, his intimate partner up. So I'm going to go ahead and add that as a three. And I'm, a, I'm able, based on the suggestions that are made to me, to add additional information that will help me to differentiate the best choice. And this is very important in a case like this where the indicated remedy is not so obvious. And once I've added those additional symptoms, I can click on the Solve button. And Belladonna comes up number one. And this is actually the remedy that was given in the case was Belladonna. Uh, I can go ahead then and uh, click on Belladonna, add it in there. I can put in the prescription details, you know, whether it's a dry dose or, you know, fifth edition organon method uh, or, you know, sixth edition using the LM or Q potencies. Uh, I can then save the prescription and go on. And if we look at this case, uh, he was given Belladonna. Um, and three months after the first consultation, uh, the psoriasis is now less. The itching is much less. Uh, he was very irritable during the first days of treatment, and his sleep was worse. About 20 days after the beginning of the treatment, he had severe swelling of the hands and feet and the psoriasis in his palms, and the soles got so bad that he lost the feeling of touch in his hands and could not walk for 15 days because of the pains. Uh, he still has uh, aversion to vinegar and desire for lemons. He still has offensive perspiration of feet. The thirst is less. The perspiration in general is less. The grinding of the teeth, the, the teeth and the talking in the sleep are also less. So you, uh, the Belladonna seems to have uh, acted in a, in a curative direction. And here we can see the value of this differential analysis feature in the program because Unlike that first case, the Assam Europan case, where the picture of the remedy was very clear, here it's not so obvious, and we need additional assistance. The, the Vitolkas compass is suggesting a number of remedies. It's even telling us down here uh, which rubrics uh, the, it's dependent on so that we can learn from it. But when we look at them and we read these remedies, if we go to the, um, the actual uh, materia medica of these remedies by clicking on the book here, um, you know, we, we don't know for sure reading it. It's, it's not so obvious, okay? Um, so this is, this is very useful in helping us in that sense. Um, there's another feature here called specific remedy analysis, uh, which allows us to take some remedies here. We can select um, uh, different remedies here, and we can extract from them. Um, so uh, we could uh, click on specific remedy analysis here. Uh, and then we could say, okay, we want to compare, for example, you know, belladonna and sepia, and we could do that for any sections of the repertory or combine that with any keywords over here. This is, in other words, extracting from the repertory uh, very specifically the remedies that we would like to compare actually manually. When we use the differential analysis or the direct differential analysis plus, the program, the Vitolkas Compass, is actually deciding for us uh, which rubrics to use for differentiation. Perhaps we would like to look at something different than that. This allows us to do that uh, uh, by, uh, independently of the automatic feature that's available in the software. We can also do this, for example, uh, we could take, for example, the remedy uh, Pulsatilla and Sepia and Nat Muir, okay, and I could, uh, for example, type in over here the, the word Forsaken, okay, and I could click on proceed, and I say, well, let me compare, you know, how do these remedies 
uh, compare for you know just forsakenness. And you can see that on the left hand side, it will have pulled up the important rubrics for forsaken as it relates to these remedies. And then again, I can add these remedies to my analysis and see how that affects the ultimate choice. So there's more that I, we could talk about in the program, but I, I'm not going to go through any more uh, tonight. I'd like to leave some time for questions and answers. Uh, we Again, this is just the first in a, a three-part series. Uh, this session was recorded and will be posted up on both the Vitolkis Compass website and the Whole Health Now website for later review, and I will also post all of the um, documents that came with the program as well. Um, and we'll save some of the other features and other cases for future sessions. So uh, I'm going to go in, head, ahead and invite uh, Eleftherius to join me back. Are you, are you there, Eleftherius? Yes, I'm here. I'm here, Kim. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So, um, all right. So we've got some questions here. There's, there's actually quite a large number of questions. We won't have time to get through all the questions, but again, we'll we'll have um, we'll have more of these sessions in the future. Uh, somebody liked the picture of uh, of of George. Uh, okay. Somebody. A lot of uh, people saying that they didn't know about this opportunity. Uh, Okay, so one question is, do you have to give intensity to the symptoms? Yes, when, when you use the Vitolcus Compass, uh, it really does require assigning intensities to system, it, symptoms. It, it really functions uh, based on uh, that way to look at the symptoms in your case. Um, so what repertory uh, program does this use? Uh, uh, you know, uh, I've been a long-time uh, advocate of not continually adding information to our repertories to the point where every rubric has every remedy and basically no rubric has the capacity to differentiate uh, cases for you. And uh, we address that issue in the Radar and Radar Opus program with the uh, repertory view editor, uh, but other software applications out there simply ignore this issue and they just simply add information. And, and uh, it's my opinion that, that more is not necessarily better. You know, Hoffman uh, didn't have thousands of remedies to work with. Um, uh, nor did Buddinghausen, uh, nor did Lippe, and they achieved tremendous success in practice. Uh, I believe that it's better to have reliable, high-quality information, and this is the approach that the people at Vitokus Compass have chosen to take. So what they've essentially done is they've started with Kent's repertory, and then they've added uh, from Kent's repertory uh, cl additions, clinical additions, from Vitokus's own clinical practice. Uh, uh, Teresa, do you want to add anything to that? Well, not really. I think you 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 covered the case um, of the repertory. Uh, as you said, bigger is not better. There's a lot of uh, information that has been entered uh, without much of thought into the repertory, and that actually yields repertories that don't aid the protection the practitioner to select the correct remedy. And this is why we started from scratch. We started from scratch. With Kent as our uh, as our basis, because our aim was from the beginning to provide a tool with the maximum accuracy, benchmarked against real world cured cases. So the repertory is made from scratch, and it's engineered to provide maximum accuracy. Fantastic. Okay, another question that came in is, uh, which is a good question, is Vitolcus Compass integrated with Radar Opus? Presently, that's not the case. Uh, you know, we are two companies that have similar visions for the future of homeopathy, and so we're we're taking first steps to collaborate at this level. Uh, as you can see, it's for me, it's not a problem to use both uh, Radar Opus and. Uh, the Vitolcus Compass software simultaneously. It's very easy for me to just go back and forth and use the two programs. Um, there's a little bit of redundancy right now, but perhaps uh, that can be addressed in the future in terms of some type of uh, file sharing. But presently, that, that, that's not the case. Um, okay. Yes. Oh, somebody told me symptom seven is wrong. Okay, thank you. I knew something was not right there, but thank you very much. I was typing pretty fast there. 
Okay. Uh, okay, somebody asks, and this is a fair question. I'm going to go ahead and answer it. Uh, somebody says, uh, I, I have, uh, I put, I have uh, Raider Opus and I have the Vitolkus Expert System. Would I have to purchase Vitolkus Compass separately if I want to use this method, or is this one and the same thing? You know, there are some similarities between these, and I, I've had uh, the opportunity um, over the last um, few weeks to compare uh, the Vitolkus Compass and uh, the Vitol Vitolkus uh, Expert System. And oftentimes they do produce uh, similar results, but to be perfectly honest, uh, I found that in a number of my cases that the Vitolkus Compass uh, suggested the remedy that I had prescribed, which had actually acted in the case whereas the Vitolkus Expert System had not. The, the, currently, the Vitolkus Expert System is a, a program which is, was developed quite a while ago and it has not been recently updated. So the algorithms and the, um, the computer program that's gone to the Vitolkus Compass is a little bit more recent than what you find in the Vitolkus Expert System. So even though in many cases you'll see similarities and similar suggestions, and certainly both of them are preferable to numerical repertorization, um, I would say that presently uh, the Vitolkus Compass will in some cases suggest a remedy uh, that you will not see suggested in the Vitolkus Expert System. Um, okay, we're we're running out of time. There's a lot of questions here. There's a lot of participants on the call. So, um, Electors, can you please tell people what they could do next in terms of if they want to try out the system or how how they could actually try this for themselves and see if they would like to utilize this in their own practices? Okay, the uh, easiest thing for them to do is just uh, log on to our website, www.vitholkuscompass.com, and there's um, a clearly up uh, on the page, there's a sign up. If you, can, if you can provide that for me, please. So, where's our website? Uh, there you go. Okay. Thank you for that. So here on the top of the page, right next to login, you can see a sign up. So everybody can have their free account. They can apply for a free account. And um, it's a seven days trial with a lot of uh, credits for them to practice. And of course, afterwards, I believe that we can also grant them, if they're interested, an extension so that they can probably uh, follow up with the next of the series of your webinars here. Because also from inside the uh, software, everybody can receive the cases already rubrified. So when they log on to their account, they will see the cases you are presenting. They'll be there for them, and uh, they'll just uh, it's it's a lot e it will it will make life a lot easier for them. And I also strongly suggest, as you said, that they follow the tutorials which are already in there. It's like probably less than an hour, and. Uh, it, it, it will pay off. I believe it will pay off tremendously. Uh, the Thilkus Compass has been created from the ground up as a, um, as a scientifically approached expert system to heal the maximal accuracy and to function also as a cradle of knowledge and as a solid foundation for the homeopath of all levels. So it's, it's a good place to start your practice and it's a good place to continue your practice and it's a good way to practice and it's as as you also said we we share our company with your company shares a vision of homeopathy which is much bigger than the success of just the software we're here to help the establishment of homeopathy to help the advancement of homeopathy and to help people better their practice and, and better everybody's life. So that's it. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, homeopathy is uh, a real passion for me in my life. I've been doing this now for almost 30 years. And it, it offers so much to humanity, to really all suffering beings. And, you know, we need to get the word out. We need to have 
people who are practicing in such a way that they're achieving the type of success that you know people like Lippe and Herring and Phineas Parkhurst Wells and, and Hahnemann were able to achieve. And I think this is a tool that can really assist in that process. And I think it integrates really well with um, your radar or your radar opus programs. Uh, it, it's, it's fantastic if you're, if you're on a, um, a, a mobile device. Um, and uh, I know that uh, both companies share this uh, vision for the, the future success and growth of homeopathy. So I want to thank uh, everyone. We're out of time, unfortunately. Please join us for the uh, next two sessions in this series. Uh, we'll be doing more cases, more Materia Medica, uh, and really exploring the depths of this new tool and how it can help you both in your study and practice of homeopathy. Uh, Elif Terrace, thank you again. I hope you can go back to sleep now. And uh, I want to wish everyone who was on the call a very good uh, evening or afternoon or day or whatever time it is, and look forward to uh, all of you being on the next session. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.